Welcome back to the second session of our meeting today. And my name is Tash Palazos and I'll be the chair for, for this session. Um, just to give you some context. So um, uh, we uh, are, are truly a, a national Australian meeting. So Volker was uh, presenting from Adelaide and I'm presenting from Melbourne. And Melbourne is uh, Australia's second largest city by population. Uh, and we are situated about uh, one hour flight east from Adelaide from where Volker was. And, uh, and you can see a little bit of a background of what our city looks like. And in fact, this resembles the time of night that's here right now. So uh, it's getting close to, to dark here in Melbourne. Of course, in the Northern Hemisphere, we have the opposite, uh, uh, opposite season. So it's uh, getting onto summer here at the moment. So uh, in today's, uh, in this session, we have two speakers uh, and they are early career researchers in industry, of course, uh, and we will continue uh, with our question and answers. Uh, just for the audience, I do encourage you to, to ask questions. We have a number of um, tabs on the bottom of the Zoom screen, uh, and you'll notice on the right-hand side, we have a Q and A tab. I encourage you to submit your questions there. Uh, that'll allow us to um, go through the questions and, and be able to, uh, and to uh, provide them to the speakers. Okay, so without further ado, it's my great pleasure to present our first speaker uh, this morning. Um, it's Rene Liebel. Rene Liebel is a postdoctoral scientist in continuous flow technologies at Hoffman La Roche. Uh, Rene, uh, just to give you some background of his biography, completed his MSc uh, in technical chemistry at Grass University of Technology in the field of carbohydrate synthesis. Uh, on completion of his MSc, he then joined Professor Oliver Kappa's group at the University of Grass and the Research Center for Pharmaceutical Engineering for his PhD in continuous flow chemistry. And in his studies, he focused on multi-phase reaction and process analytical technology. Uh, upon completion, he then started a postdoctoral fellowship uh, in April 2021, uh, where he uh, embarked on a career as a postdoctoral scientist in the uh, process chemistry and catalysis group in Roche, where he's currently supervised by Jörg Siedlmeier and Kurt Puntiner. Uh, his talk today is Catalytic Static Mixer Enabled Hydrogenation of a Key Phenetronib uh, Intermediate. So over to you, Rene. Okay, thank you for the kind introduction. I will briefly share my screen. Mm, can you see it well? Yep, that's fine. Okay, perfect. Good. So thank you again for the introduction, also for inviting me to this conference. Uh, good morning from Basel and good evening uh, if you're in Australia. So uh, today I would like to present the case study. Uh, it was the final project which I did during my PhD in the group of Professor Oliver Katte. And it will be about continuous flow hydrogenation uh, using catalytic static mixers. And this uh, project was done in collaboration with Roche. So to give a little bit of a background, uh, phenobrutinib is a Bruton's tyrosine kinase inhibitor, and Bruton's tyrosine kinase is involved in B cell amyloid uh, cell activation, and therefore it has become a target for potential therapies in autoimmune diseases and neurodegenerative disorders. Phenobrutinib is a reversible inhibitor, and currently it's in phase three uh, for the treatment of relapsing and primary progressive multiple sclerosis. Uh, the synthesis of this uh, molecule is convergent, and I would like to focus on the upper part here. Uh, just give me a minute, PowerPoint got stuck. Sorry for that. Oops. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I would like to focus on the upper part here. Uh, the synthesis starts with this uh, piperacine building block and followed by a book called Hardwick coupling and then reductive formination where this keto oxytane uh, yields nitropyridine. And this is the substrate for the hydrogenation reaction to for afford the corresponding aminopyridine, which is then further uh, reacted in the second book called Hardwick reaction. And key in this reaction is to control the amount of impurities. So, sorry. Okay, my PowerPoint seems to be really slow today. Apologies for this.
Okay, for the uh, impurities, uh, we have the direction pathway proceeds via two intermediates, via the nitrosa species and via the hydroxylamine species uh, to get the aminopyridine. And in addition to these two intermediates, we also identified uh, three other side products, uh, namely the uh, azo impurity, cystimeric, uh, thimeric azoxy impurity, and also the product of uh, uh, CH activation uh, coupling reaction. And goal was to maintain the amount of impurities below 0.1 area percent, according to UHPLC. Uh, there has been already a process developed uh, for this procedure and uh, the reaction has been done at 80 kilogram scale in batch already under the following conditions which you can see on the left side and the goal of this project now was to establish a protocol uh, how to establish this process into continuous flow so why would you run want to run a uh, hydrogenation and continuous flow in the first place. So there are several safety aspects. Some of them have already been covered by Bert earlier. So uh, there's a big impact of the amount of headspace, uh, which can drastically be reduced or is even non-existent in a plug flow reactor. And also reaction enthalpies, which very often come along with these reactions can be handled much easier. And also, if you think about pyrophoric catalysts, if you're able to immobilize them in the continuous flow reactor, uh, you can avoid the uh, uh, potential dangerous uh, filtration step. There are also several uh, efficiency aspects to it. So first of all, if you have a heterogeneously catalyzed hydrogenation reaction, you would typically have three phases present. And also in a continuous flow reactor, you have better surface to volume ratio. And also you can precisely dose the equivalence of your gas, so in our case, the hydrogen, and control the stoichiometry by this. And if you think further ahead for campaign operations, uh, the, the cleanup step uh, will be facilitated. A general or simple flow setup for hydrogenation would look like this somehow. So it would have a substrate and a liquid feed form delivered by a liquid handling pump. And then you would have your hydrogen gas and combine them just before or within a hydrogenation reactor, uh, which is additionally pressurized by a back pressure regulator. There are different strategies if you want to immobilize a heterogeneous catalyst uh, in your flow reactor. So the most prevalent form is the packed bed columns, where particles can range, uh, particle size can range from several micrometers up to spheres with. Uh, in the lower millimeter range. Uh, there have been a lot of work done on coated wall reactors and also uh, falling film reactors. The other strategies uh, where the catalyst is uh, immobilized in some uh, foams or open foam structures and also as uh, it has been carried out by uh, CSRO for about five years now, uh, the catalyst can also be immobilized on uh, 3D printed scaffold to get uh, so-called catalytic static mixers. And we also wanted to use this technology. And for our lab uh, reactor, uh, we were using a Muprova lab reactor, which is like a tube and shell reactor with four plus four channels uh, connected in series. And you can already see on the pictures, the channels have a very flat cross section. So this allows for a very good heat transfer and uh, off the shelf, this reactor comes with these uh, herringbone shaped mixing elements uh, to promote the heat transfer between uh, direction, medium and director wall. And in our case, we were replacing them partially by uh, catalytic static mixers. And in this case, for this project, we have been using uh, catalytic static mixers where uh, palladium was in, uh, immobilized on an alumina film to increase the effective surface of the mixer. For the scale-up strategy of this reactor, uh, you typically would only slightly increase the channel cross-section when going from lab to production scale, or you can even maintain it uh, in the same size. And you would simply increase the reactor volume and the throughput by either parallelization or elongation of the uh, channel paths. So as I showed you on the previous slide, you have uh, eight channels in total and you can have different configurations uh, for your catalytic static mixers. 
So if you have, if you look at the reactor from the front or from the side, uh, for preliminary screening, we were only uh, using one catalytic static mixer, which is 15 centimeters in length. And so it fills half of our reaction channel. And after some preliminary experiments, uh, we increased the number of catalytic static mixers to four. So now we fill two complete channels, uh, whereas two channels still serve, uh, still filled with the regular herringbone shaped mixing elements to promote gas liquid mixing. And then ultimately, uh, throughout this project, uh, we would scale up the active uh, volume of our reactor uh, with up to 16 catalytic static mixers to give a, a reactive volume of about 27 milliliters. The rest of the equipment is uh, commercially available. So we were using uh, HPLC type pumps for liquid feed. Instead of the hydrogen cylinder, we were using a hydrogen generator uh, with an integrated mass flow control and pressure sensor. And the final setup, we also used uh, heat exchangers to pre-warm uh, the reaction solution going into the hydrogenation reactor. Uh, the reactor and the uh, heat transfer medium were equipped with seven temperature sensors and also pressure sensor at the output. Then we had a back pressure regulator, which was electronically controlled. Uh, via lab management system. And at the very end, we have a gas liquid separator, so a simple TP shaped uh, separation unit, uh, where at the bottom of the TPs, we would both measure the uh, liquid feed in line with an IR cell. And also with, uh, this was the point where we took uh, on the new HPLC samples. So for this project, uh, this project benef uh, greatly benefited from the process analytical technology we used. So on one hand, uh, the inline IR with a, a sampling interval of 15 seconds. And on the other hand, an online UHPLC uh, with a four minute isocratic method. And whereas with the online UHPLC, we were following the conversion from starting material to uh, desired product to the amino pyridine. Uh, in the IR, we also observed uh, in addition to these two signals, a common signal of the of both substrate and product, which uh, was an indicator for the overall concentration, as well as the water peak at about 1600 wave numbers. So after preliminary screening of our static mixer, and we decided to go with the palladium on alumina mixer. Uh, we started off with uh, low flow rates of about one milliliter per minute liquid flow rate, 20 milliliters per minute gas flow rate at 80 degrees and 20 bar and the residence time of about two minutes. And at T minus uh, T equals zero, uh, we started to switch from solvent, uh, the, the input to our substrate. And then we see a delay of about 15 minutes uh, until the uh, product or the substrate is detected by our process analytics. And then we have a steady state operation for about one hour before we switched back the, the input from, uh, from our substrate solution to the respective solvent. So the throughput in this case was about uh, 3.3 grams of substrate per hour, so relatively low. Uh, but also uh, first experiments looked quite promising. So we had uh, nearly quantitative conversion. Uh, residual nitropyridine substrate was below 0.1 area percent. And the combined levels of ATO and oxoxy impurities was about 0.14 area percent, according to the offline UHPLC, uh, which we measured in addition. And here in this graph, you can still see the amino pyridine as the main product uh, going up. We also uh, observe the water signal as it is formed as a, a byproduct of this reaction. And also the overall signal uh, maintains constant. So at this point, we were very optimistic and we wanted to increase the throughput uh, by increasing the flow rates. So we tested uh, five different levels from one to five milliliters per minute, and we adapted the hydrogen flow accordingly. Uh, however, what we observed uh, by our, our process analytics is where the process at one milliliter per minute liquid flow rate appears rather stable. The higher you go with the liquid flow rate, uh, the steeper the decrease in uh, performance of the process would get. Uh, whereas with uh, five milliliters per minute, uh, you already see 
a very large amounts of uh, starting material left in the process. Going back to the uh, one milliliter per minute, however, uh, we saw that the process did not fully recover, but we still saw some uh, residual starting material left. A uh, very similar behavior was observed when we increased the concentration of the starting material a little bit from 0 0.2 to 0 0.4 mole per liter and started to vary the temperature in five different intervals. So again, at 60 degrees Celsius, you see a very steep decrease uh, in activity. And while you're going up with the temperature, uh, the conversion gets better and better. But again, if you go back to previous conditions, so if you compare 80 degrees here and 80 degrees here, uh, it seems to constantly uh, decline. So next step, as we already observed from previous projects, uh, we tested some protic solvents such as ethanol or methanol. However, we quickly realized that this would have a very negative effect on the amount of uh, side product, products uh, generated, especially uh, the dimeric impurities. So another uh, thing we tested was to add additional water to the reaction. So there's already some water present as a, as a sub byproduct, but again, we wanted to add additional water equivalents. And when we screened this, we actually observed that just by uh, adding more water to the reaction, uh, the activity seemed to get better and better. And so we tested up to four equivalents of water. At this point, we were a little bit concerned about the stability of our alumina coating, since we did not know uh, how it would behave under high temperature and aqueous conditions. So we tested, uh, we wanted to sacrifice one catalytic static mixer while exposing it to a mixture that was almost a one-to-one -one mixture between water and THF. Uh, however, uh, ICPMS analysis showed no significant leaching of the palladium in this case. And I will also further discuss on these uh, 133 ppm, uh, which we measured in this case. So knowing that uh, water would be beneficial for the stability of our process, uh, we went on to double the amount of catalytic static mixers from four to eight, and then really started uh, to test how, how far we could get with the throughput of the reaction uh, while varying the water equivalents. So in total, we tested three different levels of uh, throughput where we maintained uh, liquid and gas ratios constant uh, versus three levels of water. So two, four and eight additional equivalents. And in this case, the additional water was delivered by a second HPLC pump. So here you can see the, uh, the process data from the input. So pump A delivers our uh, substrate solution and pump B delivers the water in three levels. And also the, the hydrogen feed was adapted according to the uh, pump A of our substrate feed. So things look very well on this graph already. So what you can immediately see is that the, the water signal can be nicely followed by the inland IR and the apparent decrease in amino pyridine uh, could be explained by the decreasing overall concentration as you dilute your stream with, uh, with water. So in this, uh, these conditions, we got a throughput of up to uh, 53 grams per hour of substrate. And we took offline uh, samples for each of these conditions and analyzed them uh, on the UHPLC again. And in this case, we saw that uh, we get very good results. So typically around 89% conversion or higher to our aminopyridine, nitropyridine, some very low ranges also low ranges of the CH activation dimer and combined A and subsea levels that they would uh, with four milliliters per minute throughput all be below 0 0.1 area percent. And if you go up to zero, eight milliliters per minute throughput, you can still maintain uh, them below 0 0.1 area percent if you use eight equivalents of water. So based on these results, uh, we decided to do a long one with just conditions just in the middle here with six equivalents of water for 16 hours over two days. So on day one, we saw a very stable process. You can follow the output flow rate of hydrogen, the pressure sensors, both for the hydrogen pressure and the, uh, after the hydrogenation reactor, and also the temperature. 
One issue we observed, however, was that uh, after about eight hours of operation, uh, the product started to precipitate after the output. So when it was cooled down, and this caused some problems with the inland analytics. Uh, however, the offline samples we collected uh, were still all within our specifications. And on day two, uh, carried out the process for an additional six hours, and we ran into th some other issues. In this case, uh, one of the liquid pumps uh, needed to be replaced uh, during the process. So this is the interruption we can see here after about five hours and 15 minutes. But uh, thankfully, due to the inline IR, we could react quickly and also divert this respective section to waste. So in total, we collected 16 fractions uh, of each uh, about 480 milliliters and analyzed them again on the offline UHPLC. And here we can see the trends for the major impurities over time and also the trend for the amino pyridine in time. And we're very glad to see that the process uh, activity did not seem to get worse over time, but be very stable and actually slightly to, uh, to increase. From these fractions, we also took uh, six selected of them and subjected them to further ICPMS analysis to have a look at the palladium leaching. And we analyzed them together with a few reference examples. And what can be seen here is that the starting material solution uh, already contains about 1,300 ppm, so about one order of magnitude higher uh, than what you would receive at the output. So at the moment, uh, we are assuming that the palladium in this case is absorbed on the alumina coatings. However, the amount of palladium uh, being absorbed is in very low amounts, so we do not expect that it has uh, much effect on the activity of the mixers. And last but not least, we wanted to see how far we could go with this process and increase uh, the active volume again from eight CSMs to 16 CSMs. And in this case also, we could use the four temperature sensors, which are in the connection channels here. So in this case, we had six temperature sensors only within the process stream. And we started by increasing the uh, throughput from 16 up to 30 milliliters per minute while maintaining a constant gas flow rate. And one of the issues we observed was that with this high throughput, uh, we had generated some pressure drop at the outlet after the back pressure regulator. So here uh, at 27 milliliters per minute, the tubing needed to be replaced by a larger inner diameter tubing. But uh, as you can see, we were able to restart the process and then also obtain data for 30 milliliters per minute liquid throughput. Uh, offline UHPLC analysis uh, showed that actually all uh, five process conditions are within the desired range. And this is actually more than double what you would expect from the previous experiment. So with eight catalytic static mixers, we were limited to eight milliliters per minute throughput. Whereas with uh, 16, we could even go to 30 milliliters per minute throughput. And one of the reasons might be explained by the uh, reaction exotherm, which we started to see as well. So here you can see the signals for the six temperature sensors of the process stream, and also for the thermal fluid going in and out of the reactor. And there's a clear trend that with increasing uh, liquid flow rate, you would also see uh, increase in your uh, reaction temperature. And whereas the jacket temperature was set to 120 degrees, this very first sensor here after the first reaction channel uh, recorded temperatures of up to 130 degrees Celsius. Nevertheless, under these process conditions, uh, we wanted to run the process for one additional hour uh, to test the productivity. And here we we're able to convert about 1.8 liters of substrate solution within one hour. And this corresponds to nearly 200 gram of substrate, which was consumed. And this comes down to a space time yield of about uh, 6.5 kilograms per liter per hour. This brings me already to the end of this presentation. So, uh, this project, we demonstrated that we could uh, establish a protocol uh, which was stable for the time range investigated in the lab, uh, which corresponds to 16 hours long, a 16 hour long run with eight catalytic static mixes. 
the throughput limit to maintain within the specifications uh, was could actually be increased from uh, 53 grams per hour by doubling the catalytic static mixes to about 200 grams per hour, most likely also due to the increased mixing at the higher velocities. And in total, we uh, ran the entire development project with uh, two, kilogram, two kilogram of substrate. In this time, we also collected over 1,100 online UHPLC samples and about uh, 72 hours of inline IR data. At this point, I would like to thank a lot of people who contributed to this project. Uh, first of all, my colleagues at Ross, my former colleagues from Unigrads and RCD, especially Professor Kappe for giving me the opportunity to do my PhD in his group and for assigning me on these exciting projects and also our collaboration partners in Australia, especially Christian Hornung and his team at CSIRO. And last but not least, you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Renee. I really enjoyed your outstanding talk. Some fantastic process intensification there around hydrogenation. So thank you very much. What I will do thank now you. is open the floor to questions. Um, and it looks like we have one question from uh, on the chat. Uh, window. So once from Christian. Renee, can you read that question or do you want me to read it out for you? Uh, I'll try to get the window up. Yeah. Um, just the, the small window here now for this. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's okay. I can, I'm happy to read out the question for you if you like. Yeah, probably. Yeah, no problem. Easy, so, yeah. Um, Christian also congratulates you on a fantastic talk. Um, he is very interested in the temperature effect of the reduction. Uh, so yeah. the palladium on alumina is very interesting, especially that there is a time dependent decreasing performance at low temperature. So that's at 60 and 80 degrees Celsius and a stable mm -hmm. performance at high temperature. That's 120 and 140 degrees Celsius. Mm -hmm. This could be because of an increased hydrogen adsorption at higher temperature. Have you ran longer experiments at low temperature to explore that further? Mm, no, in this project, we, don't, we did not uh, run the process for longer times. Uh, we did with some previous projects where we were using uh, model substrates. But in this case, so here, the entire project was carried out with THF as a main solvent. Uh, the previous projects, we screened other non protic solvents as well. But typically, we would then see that uh, use of a protic solvent would actually be very beneficial. Mm -hmm. So also, for example, if you add uh, ethanol to ethyl acetate, uh, by this, we could actually see that we can increase the performance. So it's, it's a, very good, uh, a very good point. So we didn't further look into the hydrogen absorption. But in our case, we assumed more that it was because of some uh, intermediates which could be washed off with protic solvents. Okay. Uh, Renee, I've, I've got a question for you. Um, mm -hmm. On slide nine, you had uh, a peristaltic pump on your scheme, yes. uh, which I wasn't quite sure what the role of the pump was. Can you, can you elaborate that on? Yeah, so here for the, the peristaltic pump, it simply served to uh, take continuously withdraw samples uh, for the online UHPLC analysis. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So here we have the, the stream coming from the gas liquid separator. Mm -hmm. And we have the IR probe at this point. And just in front of the IR probe, we would have the input tubing for the peristaltic pump. And we would then continuously pump through this uh, 10 nanoliter injection valve. So in this case, we didn't need to dilute our process stream, but just inject the need. Uh, process mixture onto the UHPLC column, uh, since the volume was just 10 nanoliters. Okay. So it would have about a 30 uh, seconds delay from the sampling point uh, up uh, until the injection point. So this pump uh, just continuously uh, operated and this injection valve was triggered by the uh, UHPLC. Great. Okay. Do we have any more questions from the audience? Okay. So one, one more question from Peter. Um, mm -hmm. Have you determined the palladium levels in your product? Uh, in this case, we did not isolate the product further, uh, but just the mixture. So for the mixture, it was, uh, as I showed you on the uh, 
one of the last slides was in the range between 100 and 130 ppm. Uh, however, due to the synthesis of this uh, uh, compound, so actually the, the the product came from, or the substrate solution came from a Buckwald hydro gamination. So this was also the, the reason for the uh, 100, uh, 1,300 ppm we had in our starting material. And then it also uh, would be further processed in a second Buckwald hydro reaction. So in this case, uh, the 130 ppm are we're not an issue to us. Okay, so we have one more question and this is from Samit. Uh, thank you for a very nice presentation. Uh, did you see any reduction in the catalyst activity over time? Mm, not within this project. No, actually we, we were using the same catalytic static mixers throughout the entire project. And uh, yeah, during this time range, we didn't see a decreased activity uh, besides what, what I've shown you with the, with the additional wash from the, from the water. Okay. All right. I think that's all we have time for. So thank you very much, Renee. And uh, we really enjoyed your talk and, and we hope you can stick around for, for the remainder of the session. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much.